how do you really create this, you know, transparency, you know, this truth of our artificial harmony? And Boo, you'll remember in the fighter squadron, you know, one of the things that we did is, you know, we, we you know, we hypothetically ripped the rank off of our shoulders and the name tags off of our chest. It's one of the reasons they're on Velcro before the debrief started, because we didn't want rank uh, or your experience level to get in the way of the truth, which happens so many times in business. So what I encourage our business leaders to do when they start a debrief is do inside outside criticism in front of their audience first or their team first. Here's one or two things that I could have done as a leader to have executed better before you start asking them what they think they could have done better. So it's just so important to create a psychologically safe environment before you start peeling back the onion. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Few with me, Boo, and my uh, awesome co-host, uh, Shawnee Sean Sewell. G'day, Sean. How are you today, mate? Great, Boo, mate. How are you going? Yeah, excellent. excellent. Fantastic. I've been flying all week, full of beans, got home at one o'clock in the morning, five hours sleep straight into a podcast with uh, an absolute legend and a really good friend of mine and someone that's really transforming uh, the business consulting space and bringing uh, two worlds together, a high-performing world that a lot of people really don't get a lot of insight into and transforming that uh, into business and really redefining what it means to be a high-performance individual, a high-performance team, working in remote environments, but most importantly, uh, taking an idea or a concept and turning that into to reality through a process uh, that uh, that this uh, gentleman invented called Flawless Execution. Uh, so I'd like to introduce now uh, Jim Murph Murphy, former fighter pilot, current entrepreneur, and all-around fantastic guy. Hey, Murph, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, it's great to join you, Boo and Sean. How are things down under? Awesome, mate. Awesome. Welcome. Really, uh, thank you for coming on board. Really, really looking forward to uh, today's episode. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited as well. Good to be here. So, Murph, here we are again, COVID, uh, as an entrepreneur for uh, 20 plus years. You've been here. You've seen it all before. Uh, a lot of disruption. You're, you're probably licking your chops right now thinking, wow, what a great time to seize the day and exploit some opportunities. How do we turn what is a, a negative world that we're all living in right now? A lot of people really worried about their business, worried about their jobs. W what's the mindset that they need to adapt right now to thrive and move forward and win? Well, and chaos is great opportunity. And, you know, one of the things I learned as a fighter pilot is, you know, we, we, we thrived in chaos. Matter of fact, we anticipated and looked forward to chaos because there's areas to exploit. And I think if you're an entrepreneur right now, if you're someone in business, you realize there's great opportunity. Yeah, it is a tough environment right now. Uh, the SMB, small, medium-sized business environment, even the large enterprise environment, certain industries, markets, and segments, it's tough. But, Boy, uh, from my perspective, I see great opportunity and I'm very optimistic. Now, tell us a little bit, uh, little bit about yourself because this is not the first time uh, you've been up against the wall. This is not the first time you've had to drastically rethink the way you do business. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your early years, Murph. Uh, you're, you're obviously a fighter pilot, but that wasn't kind of the first thing you, you, you did. You sort of fell into it. What, what's a bit, tell us a little bit of your backstory, Murph, from, from leaving high school and what happened next. Yeah, I grew up on a farm in central Kentucky. So I was basically a farm boy. And uh, my mom was the farmer. My dad was actually a salesman. And uh, he's got to start in selling IBM typewriters and then went on to World Book Encyclopedia and then eventually ended up uh, working for Toshiba of America selling copiers and facsimiles. So it's kind of interesting. Our dinner table conversations were at night. My mom would talk about, you know, spread the manure out, out in the backfield or making sure, you know, that the horses were fed and, you know, the water buckets were full. And then my dad was talking about, you know, closing pipelines, pers prospectuses and prospecting. And it was just an interesting time growing up in that environment. But uh, I was also blessed to be athletic and I ended up uh, parlaying my baseball skills into a college scholarship and went on to play baseball at the University of Kentucky, which is in the Southeastern Conference, a good conference for baseball. And uh, I thought early on in my early years, I was going to be a professional athlete. And that didn't happen. But I graduated from the University of Kentucky and then went to work in sales for a year and a half selling copiers and it was probably one of the best educations you could ever have. I mean, for me, communicating, overcoming the objection, understanding how to create a story, pulling people into that story, and then learning how to close. 
uh, you know, asking. Were you, were you cold calling the MF? Were oh, yeah, you actually, like, sure. were, you, were you door knocking or, or cold calling or anything like that back when you were doing that? Like, So, so this is going to really date me, but, um, you know, this is before everybody said cold calling is dead. Cold calling was, was the way we did business and sold then. So you would canvas or prospect an area, a zip code, if you would, and then you would go knock on doors and then you would try to set up a demonstration. And you basically, my, my demo ratio was about 50 cold calls for one demonstration. And I would close about 20% of my demonstrations. So five demonstrations for a close. So you do the numbers, it's a lot of door knocking. And uh, when you would demo, you'd actually physically have to carry in this giant copier into a, a room full of people and demonstrate all the features. So it's interesting there, Murph. And uh, Sean, don't you think there's some synergies there between social media? People run their social media marketing campaigns, they prospect, and they have these utterly unrealistic expectations as to how much business you're going to yield uh, from putting 20 bucks b- behind a Facebook post. Uh, but Murph, just go back there. That sounds to me like a pretty big pivot uh, out, straight out the bat. Like, w- if you have a dream and you want to do something like play Major League Baseball and then that opportunity is taken away, w- what was that like mentally? Uh, shifting from that space into the the copier selling space. Well, you know, so I know baseball is not big in Australia at all, but you know, it's you know, it's a high level sport here in America. And you know, I was very serious about it. And to play at the University of Kentucky in the Southeastern Conference, it meant that you were you had a, a decent probability of getting picked up and playing professional baseball. And that was certainly where I was going. So to not have that happen, and then limp back to your little small rural town where everybody thought you'd come back as a major league baseball star was tough uh, for a young, for a young guy at the time. So, you know, overcoming that challenge was really, really tough. And then having to go work and sell copiers door to door when you envision, envision yourself playing in front of, you know, 30 or 40,000 fans in a professional environment was tough. Uh, and, and, you know, I was successful in sales, but, you know, inside I was miserable because I wasn't living my dream. I wasn't living my best. And although I knew that I could perform at a high level in sales, I was searching for something else. And, you know, I met a fighter pilot just through happenstance. And this person was living with real purpose, doing something not everybody could do. And, you know, doing something very patriotic as well. And that really appealed to me so much so that I said, man, what do I need to do to kind of figure this out? And he invited me out to his base and actually let me climb up into the cockpit of a fighter jet. And I remember lowering myself down in the cockpit and literally having this moment, I mean, just unbelievable moment wash all over me. You know, what do I have to do to figure out how to get here? And you can imagine being raised in a rural area and there wasn't an Air Force base within 300 miles of where I was you know, figuring out how I could navigate that system and get into that cockpit. So I think when you talk to successful people, you know, they were pulled in their compelled and they figured it out. I mean, there wasn't a, a, a cookbook, a formula right in front of them. And that's what I had to figure out. So I went out and took some flying lessons and learned what a flap and an aileron was and, and soloed an airplane, a Cessna. And then I studied this process on how to get in But more importantly, I fueled my brain and my soul by just diving in and reading everything I could consume. And luckily at the time, this movie, maybe you've heard of it, Top Gun came out right at this time. It was 1986. And what Top Gun did for this, for me, was like putting raw fuel on the fire because, you know, now there was you know, context, there was music, there was passion, there was, I mean, everything in that movie just pulled me to the very next level. And I don't know if any of your listeners have ever had their lives changed by a song or a movie, but we later translate this into business. The more context you can put into the future you'd like to have, the clearer the steps to get there become. And that's what this movie did for me. Connecting with that story. Absolutely. uh, and, and, And getting the heart rate going. Uh, and, and something that business is not very good at when they think everything has to be a, a, a financial plan and a budget, uh, nothing highly motivating for individuals. Uh, you know, clearly every time you release the budget from the CFO, he needs to get on stage, loud music, whoosh, rock and roll, uh, and uh, you know, even better if he get himself in a flight suit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
you know, finding the right people to connect yourself with the right peer group was really, really important for me. So going out, finding out what that network was, finding out what tactical stepping stones that I had to walk through to get there was, was the key. And uh, so taking that initial relationship and then figuring out, you know, the recruiter's not necessarily the best way to go. And creating that relationship enabled me to initially get into the Air Force. But then, as you know, once you get in, there's a pipeline of thousands of guys that were trying to become fighter pilots. So, you know, it was kind of like the Major League Baseball career dream that I had. Uh, you know, that was my new uh, big league professional dream coming true where there were thousands into hundreds, hundreds into maybe 20s or 30s. And then I ended up going to F-15 school, which at the time arguably was one of the most sophisticated jets on earth. So 16 months later, I'm selected to go fly with seven other pilots in the Air Force, you know, the top fighter. So it was pretty cool. So Murph, what did you do that, because you, you just say it in a, in a very, uh, I guess, a very uh, matter of fact way that there was hundreds of people and then it was down to tens and then it was down to this many. And it's, it's very matter of fact, but what do you feel you did differently to stand out, to be one of the few that actually got a seat in a fighter jet? You know, what's so interesting is uh, I was a jock. So academically I was way behind my contemporaries. I mean, you know, we had Academy guys that were studying aerospace, I think when they were still in their diapers. I mean, you know, they had posters on the wall of jets. They wanted to become astronauts. So I knew I was at a distinct disadvantage academically. So that just meant that I knew I had to study much harder and I had to do the extra things just to stay on, you know, on, on an even playing field with them. And I think that determination mixed with my athletics and what I learned overcoming objections and athletics playing ball and copiers enabled me to, to have the stick to it in this and to do some of the things these other guys weren't willing to do. Once I got into pilot training, I realized that I had a knack for uh, 3D spatial orientation. I mean, I think my athletics, eye-hand coordination, a lot of that helped. But being able to, you know, both off the radar in the F-15 and then visually and then listening to everybody put together a 3D picture, both virtual and for real and react in real time, whether I was upside down or right side up, whether I was uncomfortable pulling nine Gs, that environment felt very comfortable to me. And then mix that in with the competitiveness of it. I was very competitive. Boy, it was just the perfect world, the perfect storm for me in my 20s and 30s. It was a uh, to be one of the best jobs in the world. <laughs> That's amazing. And I reckon some of the, uh, some of the guys that may have been academically way, way smarter than you uh, would have struggled in the three, three dimensional environment. You know, not that I've flown a fighter jet, but I, uh, I did learn to fly in a Piper Archer and because uh, my dad's been a pilot for his entire life as well. And um, it's a very uh, different experience, but I found that too came very, very naturally to me to actually get the plane within three hours be be basically the point where I could have gone solo and all sorts of stuff because and I wasn't that up on the, the technical side of it but the but there's the two elements obviously is the you need to have the knowledge but you need to have the physical capability of navigating that so that's that's amazing so um what one of the questions we like to ask one of our, our all our, uh, our guests is what do you feel um that, that when you wake up in the morning and and feel successful what is that driver for you what is it that says you know I feel successful today. How do you describe that? Wow. Uh, you know, I feel that way every day. Um, and I think that's because I live every day. Um, I'm always chasing. I'm in pursuit. No end, is there, Murph? There's no, there's no, there's no final goal, is there? From, from the minute you start, and I think a fighter, being a fighter pilot really teaches you that. It's just a mission after mission after mission. It's an endless cycle. You're, you're a, you're a cog in the machine for a few years. You get spat out, but the system and the machine keeps going. And, and that life is a journey, not a destination mindset. So important, don't you think? Yeah, I, I think the minute you stop pursuing, uh, at least in my mind, I would start to feel unsuccessful. <laughs> so, you know, pursuit is really important to me. So, Murph, somewhere in there, you went from being a fighter pilot, uh, flying with the International Guard, and then some, some, some magic happened. And you created what's probably one of the, the signature high performance uh, training programs globally. Uh, and the programs uh, that Afterburner deliver and Afterburner being the, the company that you founded are utilized and employed by really the biggest names and the biggest brands uh, in any respective field, be it sport, be it business, 
uh, be it a, a, a government organization. What, what happened? I mean, you, you had the epiphany of sliding down into the cockpit the first time you wanted to become a fighter pilot, but clearly there was another, another moment in time there where you took that world and, and brought it out into business. What happened there? Yeah, I think the real epiphany occurred once I became a fighter pilot, and it actually happened that 16 month, that the, the day that I soloed the F-15 for the first time. And what a lot of listeners don't realize is, you know, the pipeline of becoming an RAAF fighter pilot or, or fighter pilot here in America is really short and compact. And basically, in about 24 months, you become what we call mission ready, and you're ready to go to war in an F-15, 24 months. But in 16 months, you're flying an F-15 or an F-18. Um, and that's just an amazingly short amount of time. So I remember at 24 years old, stepping out to the F-15 to solo it for the first time. And I climbed up the ladder. And as I'm strapping in the ACES-2 ejection seat, I just stopped for a minute and said, how does a normal guy like me, Jim Murphy, country boy from Kentucky, get here in one of the most reverend seats to get in? And if you're in aviation, that's the absolute pinnacle of aviation. How does a guy like me get in this chair right now? And I stopped for a minute and I realized that the U.S. government of all places uh, has elite teams. And over the course of 50 years, they've figured out this human process on how to create ultra high performance out of individuals, teams and organizations through some simple processes. And I went through those processes, you know, from thousands to hundreds to thirties down to eight. But so did everybody around my jet. So the maintainers, the weapon, weapon ears, the guys loading weapons onto the airplanes, and we were all aligned around a mission objective. Uh, and we were all uh, executing at levels that we probably never dreamed we were executing on, you know, months or years prior, and basically getting paid basic wages for our education levels. So how in the world does the does a large organization like this put together such an elite team and create a person like me out of a normal person to become a $6 million man? That's basically the, the type of investment they put into an F-15 pilot and create this person that feels invincible. And, you know, you know, we're pretty good at what we did at a very early age. So I realized that there was an actual process that I went through. And I vowed from that moment on, when I landed from that mission that night, I went to the bar and celebrated my solo mission. But I also scratched out afterburner the name of the company and the basic tenets of this process that i went through plan brief execute debrief an agile process that enabled me and thousands of others like me to get to that place in their lives and uh that was the the birth if you will of the flawless execution model and afterburner hey, Murph, there must have been the first time you did it there must have been one day where you had to bring the skill set of a fighter pilot, the skill set of a photocopier salesman, and actually take this idea, land it with a company, and turn it into a multi-million dollar business. So, and that's that's the that's the ultimate leap for every entrepreneur. That is the uh, that is the absolute golden ticket is to have your idea monetized. And for you, that kind of happened really quickly. What? Well, tell us that story. Yeah, so uh, actually, it wasn't as quick as you think. You know, I spent seven years, you know, really focused on becoming the best I could become in my craft as a fighter pilot. But, you know, I would moonlight by reading the Wall Street Journal and really understanding the deep language of business and the challenges at the time um, and really started codifying the process and the model um, to the point where, you know, I put together a basic slide deck and talked to some friends about it, obviously, and some mentors. And then I had a unique opportunity. Uh, the weather was really bad one day and our flying was canceled. And I would work on the weekends at this company called Sky Warriors. And we had T-34s, uh, real, you know, World War II era, post-World War II era fighter trainers that we had lasers in them and cameras. And we would take civilians out to be Maverick for the day, Top Gun for the day. It was a thrill ride for them. And I was one of the safety pilots, if you will. And the owner of this company said, hey, we've got 50 business executives in from Los Angeles to fly with us and the weather's bad. And they were also gonna tour CNN and Coca-Cola and they're high level CEOs and presidents of corporations. Can I bust them over to your Air Force base and can you give them a tour of the F-15 and possibly get them in the simulator? I said, you bet, send them over. I saw this as a wonderful opportunity. Uh, 
So they came over, I showed them a jet, put them in the simulator, but then later I took them to the auditorium, the briefing room, and gave the first afterburner keynote, if you will, and briefed this model of planning, briefing, executing, and debriefing, and how we align in the fighter pilot world, and how it can be applied to pipelines and closing and business uh, uh, efficiencies. And at the end of that one hour talk, I said, look, you know, I'm one of the best fighter pilots in the world. Uh, so if you have a corporate jet, I can fly your corporate jet, but I'm also pretty good in sales and marketing. If you have a business challenge, I'd love to help you with that in your business. One of the CEOs walked up and said, I'd like to hire you. I own a paint company, a paint grinder, and we sell paint of all things. And this was back in the dot-com era. So selling paint was not super sexy. Not sure it's ever, I'm not sure in any, any, any generation that's super sexy selling paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I agreed to go to work for this company and I was in charge of their running their sales and marketing team on the East Coast, East of the Mississippi, which was all their new territories. And I hired about 18 to 20 guys. And this company had never grown more than about 3% year to year and was a relatively small company, about five to $6 million in revenue a year. We took them from 5 million to 52 million in revenue in two and a half years using the basic bones and tenets of the flawless execution model. So what you're saying there, Murph, is the whole, the whole success there, 10 times uh, growth, it didn't come through having a superstar sales rep. It didn't come from sacking everyone, starting all over some crazy financial solution, a gazillion dollars. Yeah it, well, yeah, it had nothing to do with that, right? It was purely optimizing the people and the human beings in there, right? Absolutely. And you know, this is a third generation company, third generation company that had grown no more than 3% a year. And we took them from five to six to 52 million in a really short amount of time. Now, I can't take all that credit. We had a great team. Uh, you know, we had some great uh, opportunities. Home Depot was exploding at the time and we got into the Home Depot accounts. So There's a lot of things that aligned, but they were very purposeful. We targeted them. We created a plan brief, execute debrief mission and cycle around those type of things. So we had very intentional actions with a pl really clear pre-planned future. So that worked really well. And um, I then had asked maybe to participate as a shareholder in the business and the owners decided that wouldn't, that wasn't in the card. So I left and I thought that was a great time to start Afterburner. So I cold call Home Depot. And the only reason I cold called Home Depot is I was flying the F-15 in the weekend as a reservist. And on the, in the Friday edition of the Wall Street Journal, I saw that our big company here in Atlanta called the Home Depot uh, was going to go from 300 stores to 2,000 stores in IPO up in Wall Street. And I said, wow, there's somebody in that corporate office that has a real math problem. I bet they haven't really looked at this. But how are they going to go from a small entrepreneurial company to this bohemia in a real short amount of time? So after I flew that day, it was on a Friday before a drill weekend, I drove by the home office and talked to the receptionist uh, at the bottom floor. It was about a 24-story building at the time. And I said, who's in charge of management training, leading, and hiring at Home Depot? And she said, it's this guy named David Bogage. And I said, well, great. Could I get his digits and his numbers? I'd like to come back later and maybe have an appointment with him. Realize this is pre, uh, you know, get on LinkedIn and find anybody's number. And so she gave me this guy's number. And she said, well, Captain, uh, I can see if he'll see you right now. And I said, well, that'd be great. So she rings him and he says, she says, hey, there's a Captain Jim Murphy here, 116 fighter wing to like to see. He's a fighter pilot in the Air Force. And he said, well, send him right up. So I walked into his office and, you know, I think I was 29 at the time, maybe 30. And he said, how can I help you, Captain? And I said, well, I understand you have a big challenge on your hands. And he kind of chuckled and he said, well, what's that, Captain? And I said, well, I understand you're going to go, you know, from several hundred stores to thousands of stores. I know that each Home Depot has five departments and one store manager. So it's like a mini corporation, 200 employees. So five assistant managers and one store manager. So if I do the math right, by the time you do the 2000 store rollout, you're gonna be five, six, 700 store managers short without any assistant managers. How in the world are you gonna scale this framework that quickly and fulfill your promise that your leaders just made on Wall Street? He started doing the math in his head and he goes, wow, young man, I, you're right. I haven't thought about that before. How in the world can you help me with that? And I go, well, I come from an organization that scales immediately, that can deploy on a moment's notice. 
you know, with an average education level less than a college degree. And we're one of the most feared organizations on earth in our market space. And I believe I can show you how to do that based on the training that I've had as an Air Force fighter pilot. And he goes, okay, well, how would we consume that training, Captain? I said, well, it's a seminar. And he goes, well, how long is the seminar? And I said, it's a day long. And he chuckled. He said, you're going to teach me all this in a day? And I said, yes, sir. Then he asked me the next question. He goes, well, how much does your seminar cost? Now, he's getting ahead of me now. I'm a little over my tips. I'm a little early in the game here. <laughs> and I hadn't quite thought this one all the way through. But I thought for a second, and I said, it's $350. And he goes, $350 for the day or $350 per person? And I said, no, sir, $350 per person. So he stopped for a minute and he goes, I have a hundred district managers coming in here in two weeks. So you mean to tell me to put them through your training, this is going to cost me $35,000 for the day. And when he said that to a young man, you know, in my thirties, barely making that much money myself, that sounded like an enormous, oddly large amount of money. But my copier sales training had taught me that the next person that speaks right now is the one that loses. So right after he said, that seems like a lot of money in one day, don't you think, Captain? I just stared at him and I was silent. And he stood there and he goes, well, the Air Force did put $6 million into your training. I guess this probably is pretty good stuff. Can you be here in two weeks? And that was our first deal. And we closed that deal. And now I had to go back and develop the seminar. <laughs> so I didn't get much sleep in two weeks. I brought all my buddies in. And uh, in a very short amount of time, we put together what we call, what we called then the Afterburner Experience or Afterburner Day. It was a, almost a full day experience. We put Home Depot through that seminar the first time. We got three standing ovations. We came back a couple weeks later. The same thing happened. Then uh, they, they wrote us about a $650,000 check and said, train everybody in the company from, you know, the C-suite, right below the C-suite, all the way down to the assistant manager level and the merchandisers. And um, right after we did that training, it was about seven seminars around the country, uh, the Wall Street Journal ran an article that said, team of elite fighter pilots teaches Home Depot how to become America's most admired retailer. And Fortune had just given uh, Home Depot the most admired retailer tag in their magazine that year. And uh, that was very fortunate for all of us at Afterburner because after that, you know, the phone really rang and that's how we got our start. It just exploded from there. So Hope Depot is a big brand, Murph, and I think just about anyone in the world is, is aware of that. Just, so to kick off this is pretty awesome. Well, tell us some of the highlights, some of the teams and organizations that, that have embraced Afterburner. And I know uh, as a, a speaker and a facilitator here in Australia at running Afterburner programs for five years, never once have I ever had a negative piece of feedback ever had anyone have a problem with any element of the program nothing but uh, great feedback to and and that's reflected in the in the rankings 4.9 out of 5 on facebook 4.9 out of 5 google thousands of reviews so within that framework what are some of the highlights for you well that's a testament to you boo good job man i mean when you promise flawless execution the bar is already pretty high in your customer or client's mind so it's a great job on providing great product Oh, gosh, there's been so many highlights. I, I, I think really just the team at Afterburner has been my highlight, you know, associating with folks like you for over 26 years now. I mean, some of the brightest men and women that I've been around. I mean, these are just great people, the facilitator, facilitators, trainers, and speakers that we've had and now consultants at Afterburner. But as far as the clients go, I mean, gosh, you know, I've worked with Michael Dell before. Dell exploded. I remember, uh, you know, having him under a table with a cheap plastic helmet on, screaming at him with a megaphone. And, you know, we still work with um, VMware and Michael Dell today. And you see how giant they are and how, how big they've become. Um, Andrew Nui at PepsiCo, you know, multiple NFL teams. We helped one team turn their season around. They won the Super Bowl, the New York Giants. Worked with uh, the Denver Broncos the very next year, the first year that Peyton Manning went there and you haven't had a call from the from the atlanta falcons yet mate not yet it's amazing i i know and they struggle <laughs> they're struggling <laughs> falcons if you hear this give us a call but uh <laughs> but no you know mail has just been you know big companies and a lot of times we're working not only with famous ceos but with a executive vp or vp that has his or her own uh you know uh p l but they have a can't fail mission sometimes their careers are you know, at risk if they don't get this mission through. 
And then we help them not only align better, but create that execution rhythm, that flawless execution, execution rhythm, and turn these projects, turn these verticals around. Uh, and not only has that increased the share value of like a VMware um, with, you know, with, with the CEO at VMware, we're doing a lot of work there, but boy, you know, how rewarding is it, is it for these folks that we're working with? It's, it, you know, to see their career flourish, to see them use a basic framework like ours, to help them, you know, accelerate their performance individually and as a team. So it's been super rewarding. And Murph, just to add it to what you're saying and, and having now spent uh, a fair bit of time with Boo as well and, and learning and understanding the, uh, the, the process and having experienced the afterburner experience myself and then with my own clients in, in, in a recent event we ran, um, is that, and there's something we've talked to as well, and you, you're touching on it, but I want to make it a little bit clearer for, for the listeners, which is, Boo and I spoke the other day and, and Boo, you made the comment that you believe that you know, 80 to 90% of the reason uh, that people are not succeeding in their businesses is because they cannot execute very, very well. They're not actually empowering their teams to actually execute. And, and, and I put a lot of thought into that and it was like, they probably only need to execute 10 to 20% better and a business can go from average or failing to actually doing pretty well. And, and it seems there's a lot of ideas, a lot of plans, a lot of this, but then there's all this noise that just comes in and, and knocks it out of the way. So Murph, what, what, when you go into an organization and, 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 and talking through the flawless execution uh, methodology, what, what's the key takeaway that, that goes from idea to actually making it happen? Like, what is that key takeaway? Well, there's two things. One is pulling the alignment. You know, where are we going in the future? Because the future is not very well mapped out. You can't predict a future, but you can design the one you would like to have and work backwards from there. And the other one is intentional actions that are accountable. Accountable, intentional action. So that, you know, that bias to action out of your teammates that in align towards a clear, compelling future, we call it an HDD in flawless execution, a high definition destination is the big separation point. I see a giant gap between what CEOs project on Wall Street or to their teams and their annual PowerPoints to what is actually happening down in the business. So connecting those intentional actions with a real future is the big gap. And flawless execution is all about closing that gap between you know, the reality of the future we'd like to have to the actions that are happening every day in the business. And you see this applies not only to you know, large corporates that have got C-suites and you know, hundreds of people right down to small business as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we use it in Aftermarket every day, but another great example, and this goes to Boo's earlier question, one of the most fulfilling clients that I've ever worked with is my wife. And, you know, we use false execution in our family lives. We have our own personal HDD that keeps us aligned with our businesses, both Afterburner and Advanced Care Partners. And we started Advanced Care Partners, which is a home health care agency that takes care of medically fragile children. So children that use technology a lot of times to keep them alive. That's been an explosive business. And we just sold part of it to a private equity firm two years ago. We're doing a pretty large roll up right now. Got about 2000 employees um, in two states here in the United States. We're one of the fastest growing companies in our segment. But she's the CEO and, and we started that company with flawless execution with an HDD, with execution rhythm, clear accountable mission objectives. They brief, which creates daily alignment and rigor. They execute the pre-brief plan with accountable who does what by when, we call it a course of action. We then debrief, uh, and when we debrief, we store lessons learned. And if the lesson learned is good enough, we project it out through new standard operating procedures or we brief it to other team members so they don't repeat the same mistake we did within the business. And when you're dealing with patients and patient outcome, that's critical. And believe it or not, healthcare rarely does this. So let's, let's talk about that for a bit, because you've, 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 you've really hit the, the, the powerful part of fighter, what, what really is a fighter pilot and, and, and what we do. Tell, talk us a little bit more about debriefing. What, what, what is the... Because a lot of people struggle with this uh, and they struggle with reflecting on their own performance. Everyone loves to reflect on everyone else's performance, but there's a real emotional barrier to people uh, reviewing their own performance. So why don't you frame that? What is, what is yeah. the point of a fighter pilot debrief and how does it work? Probably one of the most powerful things that we teach is in fact the debrief. And we call it a nameless, rankless debrief because the biggest stumbling block around debriefing is truth. You know, a lot of times I'll look at 
a CEO who wants to hire us and maybe he or she's already swallowed the price tag. But before we start work, I always look at the CEO and say, you know, do you really have the courage to execute? And they always laugh and smile and they go, well, what do you mean by that? And I go, well, this model only works if you value truth over artificial harmony. So I want you to think about that for a minute. It only works if you value truth over artificial harmony. Love that. And if you think about a lot of our Silicon Valley clients and a lot of clients all over the world, really, many customers, many clients value artificial harmony well above truth. So for flawless execution to work, because it's a true agile model, I would argue the most powerful one on earth, it starts with truth. And, and the truth has to start with the leaders. And if the leaders cannot have introspective in front of their teams, truthful, introspective, then they will never be able to peel back the onion around their team members and the team itself. So, you know, debriefing is about uh, peeling back the onion and getting back to those basic five whys, not just how something occurred, whether it was a win or a loss, but really understanding why. Taking the human element out of it, because, you know, Sean, you may have made the error today and it might be me tomorrow and boo the next day, but most importantly, if we can peel back the onion, find a pattern, an organizational or team pattern, we can then make a pivot. We can create a lesson learned or a best practice that will benefit the entire enterprise. So instead of having incremental growth, tactical growth, we can have strategic growth, huge impactful growth. So an example would be in a debrief, we may have missed a particular target that affected our entire sales plan. And Sean, we might be able to point right back to you because it might've been your account or something that you were doing within the sales process. But more importantly, what we really want to do is get beyond the how we missed that target or how that trigger was, 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 uh, was countered. But we want to ask why. So was it a lack of leadership, organization, teamwork, communication, discipline, experience, knowledge on the team? And, you know, it's not just one error. We might look at the two or three errors that really contributed to that overall miss because it's rarely just one, right? And by peeling back and evaluating each one of those, let's call it four different errors that went into this chain, if you will, we might ask the question, in each one of those cases, was it a lack of leadership, organization, teamwork, communication, discipline, experience, or knowledge? The next one, was it a lack of leadership, organization, communication, discipline? And we have those all written down on the board, and inevitably, you'll see several of those repeat themselves. So maybe three out of the four, the real issue was around communication. So there is a pattern. And then we go, why was communication the issue? Let's get into the exact reasoning. Well, we didn't have a standard operating procedure that all of our teams around the world were adhering to. You know, our EMEA team had one standard operating procedure, our Australian team and Asia Pac team had another one, the US team had another one. So because we lacked consistent standards around the way we were gonna communicate this particular thing in our process is the reason that Sean lost that big deal. It wasn't Sean, it was our lack of communication, but more a lack around our standard operating procedure. And those things are always there, aren't they Murph? And I, what I'm always fascinated by is how much of a blind eye is turned to it so they don't upset anyone or don't don't, don't offend anyone. And, and, and the absence of, of re realistic and meaningful objectives and targets generally means people have to make excuses because they were never going to get them in the first place. Uh, and it's that, that realism between what a leader's expectations are and what a team can actually do. And I think once they start building that winning formula, you have to establish that first, then stretch your targets. Stre it's, it's, like, it's like trying to get someone who's obese with a bad diet to run a marathon. First thing you've got to do is sort the diet, sort yourself out, then stretch and go and go hard once you are that uh, that high performing team. Now we've heard about Home Depot. I mean, working with an NFL team and taking them to a Super Bowl must have been super rewarding as well. What what are some of the things that that you've gone home and you've said I feel so purposeful and and I get this feeling. Sometimes you go home and you go, we really touched some people there and we really had an impact, particularly when people call you a year later and get you back or say that debriefing, we, we increased our sales by $45 million through debriefing. What are some of the biggest wins that you've experienced, Murph, and just gone and just re, 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 restored your faith in this, in this amazing thing you've created? 
you know, right now we're doing a lot of work in Silicon Valley and, you know, a lot of these teams out there now that they're virtual are having a really difficult time with execution rhythm. And what I mean by execution rhythm is, you know, committing to a particular mission objective and creating not just another eight hour Zoom call, but staying uber focused on a particular objective and a course of action. And having quick check-ins and debriefs, if you will, Boo, to keep that particular mission front and center. So right now, everybody's trying to figure out how to create execution rhythm in this virtual world. So right now, especially with VMware, I mentioned them several times, they're a distributed company all over the globe. So, you know, how do we keep execution rhythm going when we've got people on the Australian time zone, New York time zone, you know, in Paris, you know, how's this really going to work? The other thing is flawless execution is a great accountability tool, but in a very respective way. It really is a peer respect tool in a lot of ways, because when a team plans together, because in flawless execution, we never let the leader plan alone and spring the team, the, the plan on the team and expect the team get behind it. We, we do something called team storming where the team is involved, the leader has 51% of the voting power around the plan, but everybody's involved in that plan. So by having everybody involved in the plan, when it's time to go out and execute, the team understands the hows and the whys behind the plan as well. So if the environment shifts or changes, they still understand that mission objective. Yeah, they, and they believe it. It gives them that context, the situational awareness, the the buy into the bigger picture and the story, uh, and then to dive down into that science of the day to day execution, the execution and the execution uh, execution rhythm. You know, ensuring that things are simple. You know, everybody's getting more processes thrown on them. There's more things, and we always say simple. Simplicity is a key to flexibility, and flexibility is what's going to win in the end. So that simplicity part is really simple. And our process, the planning process, has only six steps, whether it's a complex strategic plan or it's a sales plan right before we go in and talk to a client over Zoom. Uh, the debriefing process is very simple. So these are simple frameworks that create a lot of performance. I'll say, I'll say yeah, Murph, that the um – again, having learned and applying these with my own businesses and with our clients as well, it's a very, very simple structure. The things that block it is what you were referring to before is the piece where people are willing to be honest, willing to be truthful. Um, and I think a lot of people are very uh, are sort of expecting that if it was me that caused that problem, you know, that in the example you used, that I'm going to be the fall guy. I'm going to be the one that gets taken out or loses his role or something like that. Blamed and the blamed for it. Absolutely. And so, so I'll hide behind that. No, and it wasn't me or something like that. What we've got to do is we've got to instill that culture, as you said, to, to be honest, because if one person fails, it's the team failing. It's not the individual failing. And but everyone and, knows it. That's, that's the reality. Mm. Everyone knows when it was your mistake. And when you say it wasn't me, everyone knows that you're not, <laughs> being, it's the artificial harmony Murph's talking about. Well, well, we know they, we know they made a mistake. We know they fundamentally made an error, but hey, let's not rock the boat and make anyone feel upset, upset here yeah. and, and, and lose a, a learning opportunity. Well, think about this. I mean, that's why team storming is so important. There's transparency in the, in the aspects of who's going to do what by when. We commit to the course of action in the plan as a team. It's right there and it's simple steps. Who's going to do what by when? You know, a little spreadsheet. Who's going to do what by when? Who's going to do what by when? Or is that what we all committed to? Yeah, let's go to work. Then when it's time to debrief, there's absolutely nowhere to hide. I mean, we've all committed to this. The entire team committed to this plan, but there are individuals associated with the action items in the plan. So the last thing you want to do as a team member is not fulfill your action item in front of your team. Yeah, that, that peer support, getting away from the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And, and as you recall, Murph, like in, in a fighter squadron, uh, we say debriefing is more important than the mission itself. And even if we don't fly, We'll still debrief the planning process. We'll debrief and and still learn lessons. Uh, and you work with the average sales and, and marketing team, or the or the average entrepreneur and business owner, and you say, okay, well, have you debriefed everything you did this week as a team to try and improve that sales process? Did you even practice it without calling real clients together? Oh, we don't have time to do that. We just got to, you know, it. Just becomes a numbers game, and this is where you start. As you said, Sean, the tens and twenties of percent, the amount of time wasted in poor execution is amazing. And just by reducing that, 
uh, having planning sessions, debriefing sessions, X gap meetings, and getting away from update culture of let's have a meeting with all the team and sit there for two hours and tell everyone what we did yesterday that didn't actually achieve anything. Um, that aversion to execution, once you address that, is incredibly powerful for, for an organization and for yourself. And, and Murph, the beauty of the, of the methodology uh, is it works for 10,000 people or it works for one person. That's right. And, you know, I think another aspect that you touched on is velocity. I mean, in these complex world, if you want to stay at the same rate of change or slightly ahead of it, it has everything to do with the debrief. Because if you think about it, a plan is your best guess on how you're going to affect the future, right? That's the mission objective, whether it's six weeks in the future or six months in the future. So that's the plan. Then we brief the plan, the last step of alignment. Hey, let's revisit who was supposed to do what by when. This is what we're all agreeing to. Ready, ready, let's go fly the mission. Then we execute. And we execute in a task-saturated world because we all know that once we execute, all the assumptions we made in the planning room are out the window. So now the plan hits the reality of chaos, which creates gaps. Then we debrief. And the whole purpose of the debrief is to go, okay, best, based on our best guesses, our expectations in the planning room, now that we've actually executed, here are the holes. And we debrief to close those gaps. And if we go out and replan again the very next day, based on what we learn, brief, execute, debrief, and do it again. And as the organization, as this becomes more like muscle memory, they're doing this faster. The velocity increases. The lessons learned increase. Their ability to stay ahead of the rate of change in the environment is there all the time. And that's the power of the debrief. Because if you do this, like most businesses operate, based on a balance sheet planning. We're gonna do annual planning, quarterly planning, and we're gonna review every quarter. Hey, go ask the Silicon Valley guys. In three months, the whole world can change. So if the organization is debriefing on a daily or weekly basis, passing up lessons learned up the leadership chain, and then reforming the plans almost in real time, you're talking about a fairly large organization, and look at what the New York Giants did in the Super Bowl, then you're staying at the same rate of change or slightly ahead of the rate of change and you will win. So velocity around this is a real big, big key. I love that. Love that point, Murph, that, that people often think planning is this thing. You, you, you write it down, stick it up on the wall. Let's all, you know, over a period of time, go and get it. But it just doesn't work because that first day, the first day you go, right, I'm going to do the first step in the plan. There could be a roadblock. There could be a change. Something could change in the marketplace, whatever, um, and not even you know, what's been going on recently with COVID stuff, but just in an in general business environment, it, the plan itself, the importance of it being a living and breathing thing that you are planning on a daily basis in a sense that you're tweaking what you're doing. As you say, you're debriefing, you're reviewing, you're applying those lessons and, and sharing those lessons with the team, so therefore the gaps start to disappear. Yeah, and another thing to mention is a lot of people say, well, Murph, why isn't debrief first in your model? Because the model goes plan, brief, execute, debrief, and the circle kind of goes in, meaning as we go tighter and tighter and tighter, your execution levels get, get better. But the reason planning is first is because we don't necessarily have the gift of the debrief before we start to plan, but we do have step four in our planning process, which is, evaluate lessons learned before you go execute, before you brief and execute. And if you've never done it before, I guarantee you know somebody that's done it before or at least has attempted to do it before. So shame on you if you don't go out there and get those lessons learned or even Google it and do everything that you can to get the aspects of a debrief, even in that initial planning stage. Yeah, it's, and it, this is how you empower all the different personality types, the different skill sets within a team. And the different uh, the different ways to approach clients too, because we we always have these templated approaches to sales and marketing, which don't really uh, address all the different personality types, the problems uh, that a customer or client has. But when we come together as a team, particularly most businesses are, are, are pursuing a or, or organizations are, are pursuing a very specific thing. If you're if you're a car dealership, your plan tomorrow is not going to be baking cookies and biscuits, right? It's going to be selling more cars every single day. So not only should you be good at selling, you should be good at influencing the market, understanding every aspect of it, sharing that with the sales team that then can go out and execute as the market leaders and experts in the field that just so happen to have a product that meets an outcome. And that's that relevance, that debriefing. I, I think debriefing 
it ensures that you are perpetually relevant in, in what you do and you and you are adapting the skill sets and the lessons you've learned because you're a smart business not just in the product but in the field and therefore you can adapt products and services within that field yeah i i, I agree with that one thing too that you know and, and and we can move on after this or on debriefing, but, you know, how do you really create this, you know, transparency, you know, this truth of our artificial harmony and boo, you'll remember in the fighter squadron, you know, one of the things that we did is, you know, we, we, you know, we hypothetically ripped the rank off of our shoulders and the name tags off of our chest. It's one of the reasons they're on Velcro before the debrief started, because we didn't want rank uh, or your experience level to get in the way of the truth, which happens so many times in business. So, what I encourage our business leaders to do when they start a debrief is do inside outside criticism in front of their audience first or their team first. Here's one or two things that I could have done as a leader to have executed better before you start asking them what they think they could have done better. So it's just so important to create a psychologically safe environment before you start peeling back the onion. Absolutely, it's the and and we we have that uh, as a, as a core value in our, in our business and in our uh, in our group is about that open and honest communication is, and you've got to create that safe place that that and and it and it can be hard for people who are not used to that environment. The people that are used to the fact that yeah, someone says that yeah, we're being honest and truthful and all that sort of stuff, but when they are honest and truthful and that information gets used against them. So it comes, I think it comes down to you. You've, you've got the plan, you've got the, the flex model, you've got the debrief process, you've got all these things there from a cultural perspective though, what, what elements do you feel um, need to be in place to support the execution of that framework that you guys have developed? First, the leader has to commit. And I mentioned earlier, have, have the courage to execute. So, so the leader has to role model the process. And if the leader does not do that, this thing's going nowhere. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, you know, we can inspire and fire people up and have a great keynote address, but to really pull off this framework and it, for an organization to use the flawless execution model to accelerate performance and really drive ROI, which it really will do, it takes full buy-in from the leadership team. The leadership team has to understand the simple framework, they have to role model the framework. They have to use it in their everyday business. Um, you know, if not, it's going nowhere. I do do what we do, not what we say. I guess is the uh, yeah. For, yeah, for the and it, but but I, but I also think Murph, it gives people who who are struggling to develop leaders or to develop themselves as a leader. Uh, um, and, and I've dealt with some young thrusters in an organisation. They use it to help create their situational awareness and make themselves more relevant in an organization and they get confident and that confidence transfers into better leadership. One, one core aspect of great leadership is, is transparency, right? And truth. Grass, you're right, Boo. I mean, you know, I've seen many leaders from a grassroots standpoint, you know, maybe the CEO didn't embrace it, but one particular division or vertical did. They took it upon themselves to, and it may have emanated from a single person, like you said, Boo. And all of a sudden they're getting the results and everybody says, how and why are you getting these results? And then I've seen the organization embrace that from more an organic or grassroots start as well. So that's a really good point that you bring up. So Murph, to, to bring it full circle and talk about uh, what it's like to be you, to, to be the few, what, one of the challenges, uh, everyone sees people that own businesses uh, as lucky and uh, they're, they've got all this money and I wish I owned my own business and had all this free cash flowing around. But you've certainly, COVID's just the latest in a series of economic up and downs that you would have seen over uh, 25 years. So what's your advice to entrepreneurs or to business owners that have been disrupted right now? Have you got a couple of tips to pass on in, in terms of getting through this and what's on the other side? Yeah, I, you know, yesterday, uh, my wife's company had a celebration because my wife won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award here in the Southeast. And that's an award I personally have been chasing for 26 years. I think it's the absolute pinnacle uh, award for an entrepreneur. And, and an afterburner, we're on the Hall of Fame for the Inc. 500, 5,000 list. Uh, combined, I've won that award, if you include uh, ACP as well, 11 times. But boy, this E&Y Award to me is just, you know, the creme de la creme. And my wife was fortunate enough to win it. And so, you know, the COO introduced my wife and said a few words, and then she said a few words, and I felt compelled that I needed to talk because, you know, I was looking at her employee group, and I wondered if they really understood 
the sacrifice that it takes to be an entrepreneur. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you probably don't understand the true sacrifice an entrepreneur makes. As a matter of fact, if you're lucky enough to meet an entrepreneur worthy of winning this award, many of you and many of your friends have never met a person like that. All of you have. And I can tell you that these people are super special. And the reason they're special is because they've sacrificed more than you will ever know. My wife's a mother of two young boys. She works her tail off from morning till night. She makes sacrifices that most mothers probably wouldn't make. She's also very active, physically active, emotionally, psychologically. You know, I could go through a list of hundreds of sacrifices that she and any great entrepreneur makes to fulfill the brand promise, the market promise, the dream of that business. So those employees can flourish, so that product or that serv service can flourish, but more importantly, the dream can flourish. And I told the young leaders in the audience, I said, if this appeals to you in any way, I want you to watch this young entrepreneur execute as a leader day in and day out, and not only watch what she does, but pay attention to what she doesn't do. Because that in itself is almost as important as what she does. So when, when I look back on my career as an entrepreneur, there were a lot of sacrifices. And yeah, people look at the successes. And, but I'm telling you what, uh, as an entrepreneur, if you're the type of person that can't sleep because you have a great idea, that can't sleep because you can't wait to get to work again tomorrow, even though you're exhausted today, that's something special. And if you're thinking about breaking away and creating a business or being an entrepreneur, you know, go ahead and take the risk because I think you've got what it takes to do it. And not many people do. So that takes, that obviously takes some drive and things like that. What you're clearly a very motivated individual. What, what is it that, what's that thing that keeps the fire burning for you? What, what is the driver for your motivation every day? Well, for me, um, you know, I had an idea and that was to apply what, I learned as a fighter pilot into a model that could change lives, that could increase performance, increase performance in individuals, in businesses, um, and in organizations. And I felt compelled that this formula, this process was so important that it could change lives. It possibly could change the world. And I'm just not going to sleep until everybody understands it and uses it because I believe it's a game changer. And, you know, that's been my life's work. And you know, I think that if you have something that you believe is that critical, that important, you know, that's the spark. That's the thing that's going to pull you. And, you know, there are two types of entrepreneurs. There are the, uh, the type of entrepreneurs like me that have an idea that is a burning desire. And then there are people that are great operators looking for an idea. Um, you know, and those are the folks that take a franchise concept or another idea and monetize it because they're great operators. So there's two types of entrepreneurs. I was the first type of entrepreneur. So I think there's several different circumstances we could talk about. But in my case, it's having a burning passion around your idea, your thing, if you will. And you can't sleep until you get it across the finish line. And, and that accountability, right, Murph? Because it, it, the success or failure of the execution of that rests with you. And, and that's, Absolutely. That, that's that competitive streak. That's, the, that's the, the, the hit that you get when you win. And the... And the uh, the grit and determination you get to exhibit when you're not winning. Uh, and I think this is the, the, the false entrepreneurs, uh, the, the pretenders, the, the people that have been successful with this huge uh, credit growth in the last 10 years. This is a great opportunity to, uh, to say to yourself, am I the real deal? And, and that's something I think I take out of this. Now's the time where I'm like, okay, do we take easy options or, or am I the real deal now? I'm happy to trim my cost base, live frugally, uh, do what it takes, anything it takes to just keep my fingernails uh, on the tailplane until such time as the world picks up again. Hey, Boo, you know, Afterburner created an entire industry. I mean, military guys going out and throwing up a consulting shingle and probably using parts of the false execution model and they're out speaking. But, you know, we were really the first. We created this entire industry. And back in the day, you know, putting a flight suit on and trying to take fighter pilot ideas and apply those to business, that was pretty cutting edge stuff. So, you know, when you look at entrepreneurs out there, the true entrepreneurs are the ones that are in chaotic situations like we find ourselves today that do not need 
a yellow brick road that somebody's already paved. They're the type of folks that say, I will figure this out. It's never been done before. And I'm the guy or the girl to go out and make it happen. And I think the true entrepreneurs are the ones out there that go, hey, you know, in my wife and I's case, when we started the healthcare business, we had never been in home healthcare before, but we looked at the market, we saw the opportunities and said, but we're pretty sharp people and we're very motivated. We can figure this out. And a matter of fact, I believe we can figure it out faster than the folks that are already in the industry doing it the wrong way. We can figure out a better way and move past them, gain market share. So entrepreneurs are ones that don't necessarily need the cookbook. They don't necessarily need the directions. They're the ones that kind of build it. That's awesome, Murph. Wow, it was, there's so many gems there that continue to align with the the, the common themes that are people who are, who are the few. I mean, there's a there's no easy pathway. You have to get shit done. You have to be able to do the SLJs. Do that execution. Be a genuine leader, not a pretender. Uh, and I think, Murph, the insights you shared uh, today uh, with uh, Sean and myself and our awesome listeners have been, have been fantastic. Sean? Absolutely, Murph. And uh, one, one final question I'd love to ask you is if there was one piece of advice that you would go back and give a younger version of yourself, uh, perhaps maybe when the, uh, the basketball career ended and you needed to reinvent yourself, maybe, what, what's the one piece of advice you would go back and give yourself now? Start earlier. Move early. One thing that I did with Afterburner is I waited for years to jump in. I didn't think I was old enough. I didn't think I had enough experience. I didn't think the idea was good enough. Um, but, you know, go early. And I went fairly early. And, you know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs or folks that would love to be entrepreneurs. They don't want to take the risk. You know, they've got a wife and some kids and a BMW and a mortgage and they go, gosh, I've got a decent job. I mean, they just can't see themselves taking that risk. And, you know, I would say the earlier you can take that risk, the easier it is. And oh, by the way, it gives you more time to fulfill your dream. So the biggest advice that I would give any budding entrepreneur out there is don't wait. There's never a perfect time. And right now may be the perfect time. I think right now is a great time. So my, uh, my, my advice to the young Murph would have been, don't wait another second, jump. That's awesome, Murph. Uh, great advice. Well, thanks again for taking time out of your incredibly uh, hectic schedule uh, to share uh, what is a, a phenomenal story and, and a genuine first mover in an industry that I have observed and I observe it all the time, genuinely transforms individuals and organizations. So much, uh, so much there, Murph. Thanks again, mate, for coming on. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development, and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media, the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you make the transition to the few. Yep. Good luck to both of you. I've really enjoyed it and a happy hunting to all your listeners. Good luck. Thank you, Matthew.